the fourth video about sections 5.1 and 5.2. In this video, you'll probably be delighted to know that I don't have any jokes, but I, I do have something that is pretty near and dear to me. I want to focus on something that's important for me in my research, and that's the concept of a trapping region. And I'll do this in the context of a couple examples. We'll go through these examples pretty quickly. Hopefully we can do two examples. Uh, the first one doesn't have any parameters in it. In fact, it is a uh, competing species model, which we initially write like this. dx dt equals 2x times the quantity 5 halves minus x, then minus x times y. And dy dt equals y times 6 minus y minus 3xy. So you can see that, that in the absence of the, other, of the other species, that each one grows according to a logistic model. But they're competing species. You've got this interaction term that's got a negative coefficient. So this is a competing species model. All right, let's focus on the equilibria and null lines first. It's always good to factor as much as possible. We can factor an x out of there and out of here to end up with x times the quantity. Um, 2 times 5 halves is going to be 5. 2 times negative x is going to be negative 2x. And then we've got a minus y with the second one after we factor an x out of that. And the second equation, we can factor out a y and be left with 6 minus 3x minus y. I just did a little bit of rearranging after factoring that. So setting these equal to 0 and solving for x and y would give us the equilibria. Let's find the equilibria by thinking about graphs first. Think about the graphs of the null clines. Now this is a competing species model, so we'll focus on the first quadrant. Make that kind of big. Let's focus first on the x null cline. Look back up at the top equation. That occurs when x is 0, so that's the y-axis. And also when this part is 0, which if you, solve, if you set that equal to 0 and solve for y, you'll get y equals negative 2x plus 5, a line with a slope of negative 2 and a y-intercept of 5. So the y-axis is an x null line. We've got a vertical vector field along that axis. You'll have straight line solutions along that. And a line with a slope of negative 2. I'm going to exaggerate the slope horizontally so it'll look like the slope is less or is closer to zero than it really is. So I can see this better. This is supposed to be five right there where my pen is pointing, y equals five. Slope is negative two, so in fact the x coordinate of this point would be um, 2.5. This is 5 and the slope is negative 2. So you can see I'm, I'm exaggerating it, the scale horizontally so that we can see the picture better. Uh, that's, that's an x null client, so we've got vertical vector field along that. I'll make a bunch of vertical hash marks. I'll go ahead and even make them outside the first quadrant a little bit. What about the y null client? Go to the second equation. When y equals 0, that's the x-axis. That's going to be a y null line. So along the x-axis, the vector field is horizontal. Thinking about this in terms of species, that should make sense that uh, x and y stay. Well, if x is 0, then y, that it stays at 0. And if y is 0, it stays at 0. And then we have another y null line when this part is 0. Solving for y, that'll be a line with a slope of negative 3 and a y-intercept of 6. Something like this. 6 up here will be the y-intercept, and I guess 2 will be the x-intercept. So something like, about like that. 
that's going to be a wide no line where the vector field is horizontal. Where the vector field is both horizontal and vertical, it really has zero components in both directions, and you get equilibria. So when blue crosses red, that's where you get an equilibria, equilibrium points. Here, the origin is one. The y-axis was red and the x-axis was blue. They cross. Over here, the red one is crossing the x-axis, which is blue. And up here, the blue one is crossing the y-axis, which is red. For equilibria, we can quickly find them. Zero, zero is definitely one. Um, we could have predicted this, the other ones along the axes by just thinking about what happens without, with x or y equaling zero, you can, this part goes away, and you can focus on the logistic part. The, this point right here is going to have y coordinate of three, so it's the point zero three, excuse me, zero six. That's this point right there. And then this point over here is going to have coordinates 2.5 comma 0. And the only thing left we have to do is to find the coordinates of that one, which are going to occur when both this and this are 0. Let's see if we can quickly do that here. Let's set that equal to 0 and solve for y. We get y equals negative 2x plus 5. Plug it into this one. Um, I'll let you check this on your own. We'll get an equation like this. Negative 2x plus 5 equals negative 3x plus 6. Add 3x to both sides of that equation and subtract 5, and you get x equals 1. And if x is 1, using either one of these equations set equal to 0, uh, y is going to be 3. So this point is the point 1, 3. That's the last equilibrium point. All right. We could figure out the Jacobian matrix and figure out the nat nature of these equilibria. I'm not going to take the time to do that because I want to focus on other things in this video, but you certainly could and should do that in general, when you're doing problems in 5.1 and 5.2 and, and on the exam. Let's see if I can quickly sketch solution curves without doing that, though. Certainly along the axes, it's like a, a logistic model. You're going to have arrows going toward this equilibrium point and this one along the axes. The origin actually would end up being a source if you look when you look at the linearized system. Thinking about the signs of dx dt and dy dt in these different regions, when x and y are both positive and real big, looking back up here, the x and y there are positive, but these things, if x and y are both real big, are going to be negative, and so you're going to get negative products and you get negative dx dt and dy dt in this region. And that should make sense if you recall what happened with competing species models. So we're moving to the southwest in there. Um, here might be a typical kind of solution curve coming down this way. It's got to cross that y oak line horizontally. And if you do check the signs of dx dt and dy dt in this region right here, dx dt still stays negative, we're still moving to the left, but dy dt becomes positive. And you do head up toward that equilibrium point right there. If you are over here, you're going to come down this way and cross this one vertically first. And now dx dt is going to be become, become positive when you're in here, and dy dt will stay negative 
x will increase, y will decrease, you'll head toward this equilibrium point there. And if you think about it, in both of those cases, you're, you're forced toward that equilibrium point. You can go in no other place. In the limit as t goes to infinity, it essentially has no other place to go. It can't approach some other non-equilibrium point because the vector field is, is not zero at some other point. Solution curve starting in here is going to be going northeast. It's going to cross this milk line vertically and then head northwest. A symmetric type of thing happens down here. There will be a separatrix that looks like this. It's not necessarily straight, although I'm drawing it kind of straight. Maybe I should make it slightly curvy, curvy to emphasize that it's not going to be straight. There will be a solution that approaches the origin as t goes to minus infinity and approaches this point as t goes to plus infinity. This point, in fact, when you linearize it, will be a saddle point. There will be another separatrix coming toward it from up here. And there will be a separatrix for the saddle point going away from it in these directions. And I have to stay in these slivers here and go in between those other solution curves because of uniqueness, they can't cross. And I'm unsure what happens as t goes to minus infinity as you approach this one as far as which eigenvalue was closer to zero here. I can't really tell. Uh, just by looking at this, I suppose I could throw away the nonlinear terms, but uh, I'm not going to take the time to do that. We're not really interested in that so much here anyway. We're just after a qualitative picture, and this is this is basically it. That's a thick picture of the face portrait. What does it mean in terms of competing species models? Maybe you never thought about this before, but kind of the moral of the story is not so much the quantitative results, you know, the, the particular nature of the solution curve and how it, ex you know, what kind of curve is it exactly, and what. What are its values exactly? That's really not so important because these kind of models are really just caricatures of reality anyway. They don't certainly perfectly model reality. Far from it. Kind of the moral of the model is that um, with competing species, it's, it's plausible that it would be easy, depending on what the initial conditions are, for one species to die out. And that's usually what happens. Unless you happen to be on one of these separatrices that approach this equilibrium in the middle, one species or the other would die out, depending on which side you start off on. The separatrix is hard to find numerically, and it's hard to find in reality. It would be a pretty rare thing to be on that separatrix and move toward that equilibrium where everybody's happy. The moral of the story is it seems to be the case that this is suggesting that competing species, well, don't live in harmony very well in the long run, that probably one will die out or the other. And it might be hard to predict which, which one will die off. Does that really happen in reality? I'm not sure to tell you the truth, but I suppose it's plausible. What I want to do now, though, is focus back on the math again and talk about something else. Um, a little bit about how you'd go about proving certain things in these kinds of systems. You know, nothing we're doing here is really a rigorous mathematical proof. You know, it's nice to draw a picture and everything seems reasonable based on what we've learned about no clines and derivatives and differential equations and you look at the computer and it seems all believable. But could you really prove for example, that solution curves that you know start off here and enter across this nullic line this way really do have a limit. That's this point as t goes to infinity. It is actually possible to prove in a rigorous way. It's based on what are called topological arguments. And I want to just give you a little indication of one way you could do it. Um, I can do this here. This per picture is not going to be perfect, but 
basically, well, let me let me just try to try to keep it as simple as possible. If I draw, I'm going to highlight this no, red nook line here and this blue one over here, and also kind of highlight this the y-axis in here and do some shading here. This region right here can be proven to have the property that the vector field is always either pointing inward along the boundary of it, like it's pointing inward along here, and it's pointing inward along here, or is tr or solution curves and the vector field are parallel to the boundary, or you've got an equilibrium point. That's something you can rigorously prove, and it's not hard to do. For example, and I'm not going to take the time to actually do it, but along here, along this null line, which was the essentially the equation of um, setting this this thing equal to zero, it's the equation if the line y equals negative two x plus five. Along that line, you can prove that the vector field is vertical by the fact that plugging in points along that line will make this zero and will make this thing positive. So that you're pointing upwards into the region. And along this one, you can prove that it's horizontal and pointing to the left. It'll be where this is zero, so dy dt is zero, so the vector field is horizontal, and this thing up here will be negative. You can prove that. And you can prove the vector field is vertical along this one and is zero there. And because of that fact, solutions that correspond to initial conditions along the boundary have to go stay inside this region for all positive times. They're trapped. Therefore, we call this a trapping region. And I might give it a name, I call it I might call it R or something. R is kind of a typical name for regions. And, well, using some topological arguments, you can prove that if you've got a trapping region where points along the boundary have to stay inside that region as T go increases, there's got to be some solutions that stay inside that region for all time. They're called invari invariant sets. invariant set. <clears throat> they stay inside that region for all time, positive and negative time. <clears throat> and for planar systems, for two-dimensional systems, invariant sets, um, well, they can take on lots of forms, but if a solution curve is going to approach an invariant set, the kind of sol invariant set it's got to approach has to be one of three types, essentially. It's either got to be an equilibrium point, or a periodic solution, or some, it's, sometimes it's called a, um, I forget what it's called, actually. Um, I'll have to look this up and get back to you about it. Sometimes you might have some equilibria that are kind of connected with solution curves in that kind of pattern. It could approach one of those as t goes to infinity also. There are other kinds of invariant sets, like um, if you had a, a periodic solution, all the solution, that solution and everything inside of it, which might look like this or something, that whole set would be an example of an invariant set. But any particular solution curve is not going to approach that entire set, in a sense, as t goes to infinity. So the ones that they can approach have to be either periodic or equilibrium points, a periodic solution, like this spiraling solution is actually approaching a periodic one, or some kind of solution like that. So there's got to be something that's approaching. We haven't really proven that there's no periodic solution in here, though it can be proven, essentially because you've got to be moving to the northwest there. So it's got to be approaching this equilibrium point. Those solutions have to be approaching the equilibrium point. That's not a, not a real significant uh, application of the idea of a trapping region. So let me do another example that is a more significant application of a trapping region. The system now is actually one that's sort of a modified form of the 
system you read about in section 2.4 called the Van der Paul equation. I've modified it a little bit. And I'm going to put a parameter in here also called epsilon. So this is a one parameter family of systems. But I want to I got a negative sign in front of the epsilon. I want the epsilon itself to be positive. And I'm not really necessarily looking for bifurcations, but instead what I'm ultimately after here is trying to rigorously prove that there's a periodic solution for this system when epsilon is positive but, but small. Prove there is a periodic solution when epsilon is positive and small. Periodic solution actually exists when epsilon is, is larger too, but it's harder to prove its existence in that case, at least using the method I'm going to show you. Now, I'm not ri really going to rigorously do a proof here. It just would, would take too much time. But I want to give you the idea, the, the geometric idea behind it. Um, and the idea is based on considering what's called a singular perturbation. Kind of a strange name, singular perturbation. I'm interested in epsilon positive, but if we set epsilon equal to zero, the system becomes dx dt equals y minus one third x cubed minus x, and then dy dt equals zero. So there's no motion in the y direction. There's only motion in the horizontal x direction. It's given by this expression here. In a sense, the y nullcline is everything, the whole plane, and the, the x nullcline is going to be when you set this equal to zero, which is a cubic graph. Let's see, I'll draw that in red, like I usually do. That's going to be a cubic graph that'll look something like this, and it goes through the origin. You can check that y equals one-third x cubed minus x. Um, that's really the, the x nullcline. The vector field is, is uh, both vertical and horizontal there. It's, remember, the y nullcline is really the whole plane. Actually, all these points are equilibrium points of this degenerate system. You've got infinitely many equilibrium points and they all lie on a curve. They're all degenerate. You couldn't linearize about any of these. But let's think about the motion in the x direction. Is there some motion in the x direction? And yes, there is. When um, you're above this curve, think about dx to t, it's going to be positive. y will be bigger than 1 third x cubed minus x. And you will bl blow the curve dx to t will be negative. So you got motion to the left below the curve and motion to the right above the curve. Solution curves are going to lie along straight lines. And they're going to look like this. It's almost like a bifurcation diagram from section 1.7 except sideways. Here's the one curve that happens to pass through the local maximum of the red curve here. Thinking about the signs, you're going to get this kind of thing. The x, x axis is going to be, you're going to have a solution curve along the x axis. You'll have one curve that passes through the local minimum over here. a picture of the phase portrait. It's actually pretty easy to understand when you really think about it. It's strange, we're not used to this kind of phase portrait, but it is easy to understand. 
That's the phase portrait when epsilon is great. It was, is equal to zero. Now, here's the really neat part. I want to figure out what happens to this when epsilon is ever so slightly positive. 10 to the negative 100 or something, okay? Or maybe a little bit bigger. Maybe 10 to the negative 10 or 10 to the negative 2 or something like that. Or maybe even 0 0.1, 10 to the negative 1. What are solution curves of that non-degenerate system going to look like? If you go back to the original system and think of epsilon as being positive, we go from infinitely many equilibrium points when epsilon is zero to just one equilibrium point when epsilon is bigger than zero. Why? Well, the y no decline all of a sudden becomes the y-axis, where x is zero. And the only place that's going to cross the red curve, which stays the same because it doesn't involve an epsilon, is at the origin. We go from infinitely many equilibrium points when epsilon is zero to just one equilibrium point, even when epsilon is really, really tiny. We've got one equilibrium point at the origin. But now, if epsilon is really, really tiny, think real carefully with me here. If epsilon really is tiny, 10 to the negative 100 to be as extreme, this system has got to have solution curves that look practically like this system. This is going to be almost the phase portrait in a sense. Like if you're up here, dy dt is going to be so close to zero, it'll, the graph will look horizontal. If you're down here, again, dy dt will be close, so close to zero that the graph will look horizontal. You move this way. If you use a computer, you really probably won't be able to tell much of a difference. But there is a difference. When you're over here, dy dt, x is negative over there, and so dy dt is positive. And when you're over here, when x is positive, dy dt is negative. So technically speaking, the solutions over here are moving upward ever so slightly. And solutions down here are moving downward ever so slightly. And basically, the periodic solution that we end up trying to prove exists looks like this. Say we start right about there. It moves across here very, very rapidly, moving upward ever so slightly. But I'm not going to draw it as if it's moving upward. I'll draw maybe two arrows to emphasize that it's moving real fast. And then when it gets here, it's going to move. It's going to be real close to the the red curve here, it's got to move down that curve, essentially. It's got to move down to the left, for one thing. In fact, it, it only goes up over here, and then it starts coming back down, in fact. It's got to be moving down to the left once we get, it's actually a little bit, it's got to be a little bit past the curve to move down to the left. And it's got to move ever so slowly down this way because it's near the red curve where dx dt is close to zero and dy dt is a really, really tiny negative number. So it moves very, very slowly down this way and all of a sudden when it hits this point, it's got to move rapidly over here again before it comes back up slowly over here. So there's rapid horizontal motion and very slow vertical motion. This is called a uh, a fast, slow system, and this solution curve is called a, it's got a fast, slow nature, and its graph, like a, like an x versus time, is going to have this kind of character to it. It's going to increase rapidly before it stays level, basically. I guess kind of moves down, and then it decreases rapidly before it stays almost level, moves up, and then increases rapidly. This, this is the kind of thing the graph of x versus t is going to look like for that thing. Can you prove that a periodic solution truly exists? I know I'm running low on time here, what I want to do. Yes, you can. And you can create a trapping region and use something called the um, Poincare Ben Dixon theorem. That I'm going to let you read about in the Mathematica notebook for section 5.2. Poincare Ben Dixon theorem. Basically says if you've got a trapping region, and our trapping region is actually going to be kind of an 
annular shape here. And if the vector field, so that the vector field is pointing inwards along the boundary. And if you know you don't have any equilibrium points inside the boundary, then there's got to be a periodic solution in there. I'll let you read about that in the Mathematica notebook. Again, I'll say it real quick. If you've got a region that's a trapping region and, and solutions really are pointing inward along the boundary, which is kind of the nicest type of trapping region, we don't have actual solution curves along the boundary, but they all point inward. The vector field points inward. And you know for a fact that you don't have any equilibrium points inside that region. The region here is kind of a donut shape, if that wasn't clear. Then there's got to be, for a planar system, a two-dimensional system like this, there's got to be a periodic solution in there. Now, constructing the trapping region for this singularly perturbed system is a bit tricky. Let me just sketch it for you. And you'll see it in the Mathematica notebook, too. I'm going to make this cubic curve a bit bigger. Basically, the trapping region will look something like this. Try to get this right. It's a bit tricky, as you can, if you're noticing what I'm drawing carefully here, you're noticing that these slopes of these different lines don't stay the same. I'm trying to draw this one with a slope of zero, but this one's supposed to have a slight positive slope right there. Same kind of thing down here. This one's supposed to have a slope of zero. This one's supposed to have a slight positive slope over here. This one's supposed to be horizontal, have a slope of zero, but this is supposed to have a slight negative slope. This one's supposed to be horizontal, but this one's supposed to have a slight negative slope. This region turns out to be a trapping region, and the vector field will point inward along the boundary, but only if epsilon is real tiny. See, de for example, it definitely points inward here, okay? Y, dy dt is negative when x is positive. So it's definitely pointing inward along there. But what about here? dy dt was supposed to be positive when x was negative. So technically, the, uh, the vector field points slightly upward over here. But if you make this have a slightly positive slope, and if epsilon is small enough, then those vectors will will have a slope that's smaller than this, the slope of this line. And so technically speaking, even though they point slightly upward, and this is hard to draw, they um, do point inward, because their slope is not quite as positive as the slope of this line. And so you still get the trapping property along the boundary up there. Definitely trapping along here. Over here, uh, in here, here, and here. The tricky parts are these places like here, here, and then inside here, here, and here. Those are going to be the tricky places, and it are dependent on these having a slightly non-zero slope and on epsilon being small. And there definitely is no equilibrium point inside there because we know the only equilibrium point for the system is at the origin. So it definitely is a trapping region. And um, by the Poincaré and Dixon theorem, there definitely is going to be a periodic solution inside there when epsilon is small. This is kind of near and dear to me because in my research, um, I like this example is sort of a nice example of an application that I, I um, did with my research. I, I did much more difficult application, but 
Uh, it's indicative of it. And basically what I did in my research is I, I came up with a, a way to prove the existence of the periodic solution using sort of a, a simpler kind of region where you do have horizontal um, lines all the way across, something like this. Technically speaking, that's not a trapping region in the sense that the, uh, the vector field is not always pointing inward along the boundary when epsilon is positive. But um, you can still prove the existence of a periodic solution inside that for small positive epsilon anyway using um, some techniques that I, that I created in my research for my PhD. So that's why this is kind of near and dear to me. It's uh, something that uh, allowed me to get my PhD and allowed me to get my job here and be teaching you right now. So uh, that's the end of this video.